So today we are continuing in that salvation series, and this morning's sermon is called Blessed Assurance. Now, I want to point out, let's see if, how this works. Okay, good. There we go. And hopefully you can, yeah, not too bad, you can read this all right. My message this morning is inspired by an article written in 2006, in April of that year, by Dr. Jerry Moon. At the time, he was chair of the Church History Department at Andrews Theological Seminary. And his article was entitled, Ellen White on Salvation Assurance. So he's the inspiration this morning for our sermon. Please pray with me as we begin. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we know that you have truth for us this morning from your word. And I pray that you would speak your truth to every heart here this morning. Get me out of the way that I might just be a channel of your love and your faithfulness and your truth to your people. We pray that you would speak to us, and we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever been witnessed to by an evangelist uh, Christian who asked you, are you saved? And if we believe, we answer confidently, yes. I've given my life to Christ. But, are we sure? Can we 100% be certain that our faith in Jesus is a saving faith? Jesus tells us on the Sermon on the Mount that many people will say to him, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and then he will declare to them i never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness could we possibly be among those who thought they were saved and were lost According to a survey, hopefully you can read that all right, according to a survey in 2002, less than 70% of Adventists are confident of their salvation. That is an alarming statistic. More than 30% of us are not sure we're saved. In the Adventist church, no less. Could that be us, that we are not confident? Dr. Jerry Moon says, some people, I've got this quote on the screen here, some people toil on in conscious legalism, hoping against hope that everything will come out all right in the end. So they're hoping that through their works and keeping and obedient to the rules in the Bible, they will be saved. But how do we have a realistic view of our salvation in faith, but not in presumption? That's what we'll examine this morning, and hopefully we'll find an appropriate balance. You know, I, I remember <laughs> David Shin, our pastor from many years back, was standing up here giving a sermon one time, and he talked about the two kinds uh, of uh, resurrection. There's a first resurrection, of the believers, and they will live forever with the Lord. And there's a second resurrection of the wicked, and after they're raised, they will be destroyed. And he pictured himself waking up on resurrection day and so happy to be raised, and then, wait a minute, which resurrection is it? <laughs> Can we be assured that we're going to be in the right resurrection, that we're going to be 
among the saved. And that's what we're going to try to figure out this morning, because we don't want to be worried. We don't want to be afraid about our salvation. To spend your life worshiping the Lord in fear that maybe you won't make it to heaven, it's not a good way to feel about life or about the Lord. So Dr. Jerry Moon defines salvation assurance this way. It's the inward witness of the Holy Spirit that we have present salvation in Christ. So today, I have salvation in Christ. And notice that it, he says it's the Holy Spirit assuring us. It's not our own perception. I think about the parable of the Pharisee uh, at the front of the church, and he's talking to God about how he fasts every week, and how he's such a good believer, and he, he's such a good worshiper, not like that publican in the back of the church. And he was confused about himself. So it's the Holy Spirit that tells us whether we're on track, and not we ourselves. We don't have true assurance in our salvation just because we do good works, come to church, look good, lead Bible studies, that might not be enough. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that tells us we're really giving our lives to Christ. Now, Ellen White, in Manuscript 21, has a pretty good quote about this. It's a little bit long, so bear with me. We must not base our salvation upon supposition. We're not guessing. We're not supposing. We must know of a surety that Christ is formed within the hope of glory. We must know for ourselves that the Spirit of God is abiding in our hearts and that we can hold communion with God. Then, if he should come to us quickly, or if by any chance we should suddenly uh, be ended, our life should suddenly be ended, we should be ready to meet our God. So if God called us to account today, I get hit by a truck leaving the church, and I die today, do I know of a certainty through the Holy Spirit that I am saved? So how do we know that, just as she was saying, the Spirit of God is abiding in our hearts, and that Christ is formed within us. Well, Dr. Jerry Moon gives three essential elements of salvation assurance. Are you ready? The first one is justification. And that comes only through faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. And the second element is sanctification which is growing into the new creature that Christ forms in us through the power of the Holy Spirit over time. And the third element is the good fruit that we demonstrate in our lives as a result of becoming new creatures in Christ. Just as Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, you'll know them by their fruit. So let's take a look at each of these elements one at a time. Justification. This is the work that Christ has already accomplished for us. He led a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death for us, for our sins on the cross. And he rose from the dead. And that gives us justification. It's important to realize that no work of ours could achieve justification before God. It is entirely based on the work of Christ and our acceptance and faith in his atoning work. We can't add anything to our salvation. We're sinners saved only by the grace of God. We cannot even repent of ourselves. Sometimes I know I do something wrong and I, I don't even repent of my own accord. 
We need the Holy Spirit to even convict us to repent. And then, sanctification, the second element. Now, this is the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to become new creatures in Christ. You know, we don't suddenly change when we're baptized. We don't suddenly become these righteous people. We have to grow in righteousness into the character of Jesus Christ. And over time, we're changed into the heart of Christ. Our heart becomes like Christ's heart. As we surrender our lives and our wills to God, and we pray to him, for the power of the Holy Spirit to work in us. And by the way, Jesus promises us in the Gospel of Luke that if we ask for the Holy Spirit, God is always going to give it to us. As a father would give good gifts to uh, his children, God always will answer the prayer for the Holy Spirit, which is a wonderful promise to us. But notice that we don't get sanctification immediately. Justification happens right away when we receive Christ into our hearts. We are justified in that moment. And we approach baptism, and that's our sign that we have uh, given our lives to Christ. And that happens immediately. But sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Daily praying for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, the third element that Dr. Moon points out, salvation assurance, is the good fruit of a life that reflects character, Christ's character. Ellen White says in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 41, if Christ is dwelling in the heart, it is impossible to conceal his presence. So people should see Christ in us. And we should see Christ in us also. The good fruit that we demonstrate because Christ is in our heart shows that we're new creatures, and it's impossible to conceal the fact because of our lives showing that. This is external evidence that we are being sanctified over time. But... If there's no visible change in our lives, this is clear evidence that we're not being led by the Holy Spirit and we're not really born again in Christ. And then any claim we have to assurance of salvation would be, in fact, deceiving ourselves. So Dr. Moon goes on and he says, where any of these three elements justification, sanctification, and good fruit, where any of these is absent, assurance of salvation must be called into question. But where these are present, believers should rejoice and not let Satan steal away our sense of security. So we don't listen to Satan when he says, Mick, you're only a sinner. You'll never be any good. You'll never me measure up to what Christ expects of you, which is perfectly true, <laughs> and he knows that. He's seen many mistakes I've made over the years, but the blood of Christ covers us, and we don't listen to Satan. And if that fruit and the sanctification and justification is working in our lives, then we can be assured of our salvation. So the next slide says dying to self. Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, the, these are some of the most serious words in Scripture. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, every day, and follow me. Serious words. But this is what we need to do. 
And I cannot emphasize that enough. As we become one with Christ, we must become disassociated with the world and its pleasures and its interests and its culture and its mores and values. James says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And I didn't used to like that sentence in James because I like a lot of things in the world. If you know me, you know I'm a football fan. And it was a huge adjustment for me not to watch football on Sabbath because I was in the world. And I, I'm coming out of the world, praise God. He is working in me to not think like the world. We must check ourselves every day to see whether Christ is on the throne of our hearts or any worldly attachment. Because even though we don't worship idols of, you know, stone, and we still can worship idols in our world. And we have to check ourselves and analyze whether we have an idol that is more important to us than is the Lord. He deserves our whole heart. Are we counting ourselves, our interest, our self-indulgence? Or maybe even things like our reputations as more important to us than Christ is to us. It's possible for us to profess devotion to Christ when we're actually giving him very little of our hearts. And we come to church, and maybe we serve in church, but we haven't really surrendered our whole heart to Christ. And I don't know if you've ever felt that, that uh, conviction from the Holy Spirit where he seems to be putting his, uh, God's finger on something in your life. Michael? This does not please me. I want you to give it up for me. Has he said that to you? Has he asked you for that? And what did you do? Have you given him that which he's pointing his finger on? Or are you still clinging to it? He has mansions for us in the kingdom, but is, the, is there a room in the mansion of our heart, a little closet that we keep for ourselves and we're unwilling to give him? And could that little room that we won't give him, that little closet that we're holding on to, could that injure our assurance of salvation? Could that keep us from eternity? Only he can judge. But it's walking a dangerous line. Ellen White, again, points out in, um, in her writings, she says, kind of a long quote here, but bear with me. She says, this union with Christ costs us something. It costs us. It is a relation of utter dependence on Christ. We must have a change of heart. We must submit our own will to the will of God. And there will be a struggle with outward and internal obstacles. There must be a painful work of detachment as well as a work of attachment. The reason why the reason why so many find the Christian life so deplorably hard is they try to attach themselves to Christ without detaching themselves from our cherished idols in the world. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Some believers try to let Christ into their hearts without letting go of the world, without really denying ourselves. And like she said, it hurts to deny yourself. There are things 
that just, I don't want to let go of. And when I let go of them, I feel like I'm dying. But if it's for Christ, I'm finding life by giving up that for him. You know where he said, if you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for Christ, and all the things that disturb your relationship with him, you will find life in him. And that's the only life worth living, even in this world, is, is the life with him. If we, if we think that we have assurance, but we haven't given up the world, and we haven't given up ourselves, this is false assurance. This is the Pharisee thinking he's saved, but he's not, uh, he's, he's not um, judged as righteous by God. And when we have that false assurance, and we continue in that way, it actually emboldens us, Dr. Moon says. It emboldens us in our sinful connections. So we go deeper into sin, thinking boldly that we're correct, that we're obeying God when we're not. We become more firmly entrenched in our selfishness as we become more falsely assured of our salvation. The injunction of Christ to take up our cross involves a continual, daily, dying to sin and its attractions. The Apostle Paul says, I die daily. That's his words. And a continual submerging of self to the will of God. And uh, Ellen White has a statement, to see if I can remember it, it's not in the sermon, about uh, when we give up ourselves, we become submerged in the depths of infinite love. It's wonderful when we give up ourselves and become free in the love of Christ. But it's hard to get there. It hurts. It's painful work sometimes. So where can I start? Because I don't have, I don't have the, the strength. None of us humans have the strength to abandon our, our self-interest and live for God. The place we can start is to surrender our will. The hard part is giving our will to God. Satan cannot force us to sin. No temptation exists that will force us to sin. But we let it. We surrender to temptation. But if we give God our will and we say, Lord, you fight the battle for me. I can't deny to self. It's your battle. We're standing on the shore of the Red Sea and the Egyptians are coming. It's your battle, Lord, not mine. But you have all the power of the universe. The creator God is the God of the impossible, full of power. And he's there to give you victory. And all you have to do is make sure your will is surrendered to him. You can't get it right, but he can in you if you surrender your will. And then we pray for the Holy Spirit. I've given you my will, Lord, but I'm not sure I can do this. Give me your Holy Spirit. I've never prayed for the Holy Spirit and felt that God let me down. He'll give you the power through the Holy Spirit for victory over ourselves and eventually walking away from our habitual sinful habits. It may take time, but he's got a victory in store for you. It's not work that we can do but we can give him our will and pray for the Holy Spirit.
So that sounds good, but keep in mind that we always have the freedom to leave God. We always have the freedom to turn away from Christ at any point in our spiritual development. And that's our human sinful tendency. Backsliding is easy. Endurance and faithfulness is hard. And that's why it's so necessary to depend completely on God. We, are th we throw ourselves on the mercy of his faithfulness and his, his love and his grace. And we come to the foot of the cross just as we are. And he gives us new strength every day and wisdom from the Holy Spirit. But it requires much more. It requires Bible study. We need to be in the Word. We, how can God talk to us if we're not listening? And the way we listen is to read that Word, and we hear Him talking to our heart through the Word of God. And we also need prayer. Our, our, our quarterly this, uh, this quarter is, is about praying the Psalms, and I love that because we can go to a Psalm, Psalm 91, is uh, Sandy and my favorites, Psalm 91, Psalm 103, Psalm 139, I love it. And we can pray the Psalm back to God. It's like he's talking to us and we're talking to him. But we can also ask him in prayer for the Holy Spirit. So Bible study, tremendously important. Holy Spirit Praying in the Holy Spirit, very, very important to, uh, to pray. And also, fellowship. We are not an island, and you can't be a Christian alone on an island. People say, well, my church is at home, you know, I'll just... And there are some people who have to, you know, be home. They're disabled, and they, and they need to watch online, and that's fine. But don't think if you're healthy and you're young and you could be at church that you can make it on your own. I guarantee you that Satan will try to use that because we need each other. And what is that proverb about a cord of three is not easily broken? If we have each other, we can stand against the, the wiles of the devil. So we need the fellowship. So basically... <laughs> It's like we need conversion every day, reborn in Christ every day. Now, you've probably heard this quote. I love this quote, and I'm sure you've read it before, but let's take another look at it because she says this so well. Christ Object Lessons. No man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. And then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I can't give it. It's thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. Amen. Amen. That's what I want to tell God every morning. Do it in me, Lord. Now, Dr. Moon has uh, some very, uh, very uh, comforting advice for us because he said that our assurance is not based on ourselves, it's not based on some irreversible guarantee, like, okay, once I was baptized and I gave my life to Christ, I'm eternally saved. Nothing can ever, you know, break that. Once saved, always saved. He says, no, it's not a guarantee, but rather our security is in serving a God who is divinely persistent in seeking sinners. You just try to turn away from God, and he's going to hound you. Uh, some commentators talk about the hound of heaven. 
Because the Holy Spirit's going to convict you. You know when you're doing wrong. And if you've turned away from God, I remember in past years, I turned away from God for a little while, months at a time, and I kept hearing his voice. And I was saying, not today, Lord. I don't want to come back today, but I know you're calling me back. And I... <laughs> Funny thing was, I wasn't really walking with him, but I knew he was going to call me back. I just had confidence that the Holy Spirit was working and planting seeds and calling me back, and he did. And that time, it started with humility. I just fell before him and said, Lord, I'm nothing but a guilty, dirty, filthy sinner. I've been doing my own thing for too long. Please take me back. And he threw his arms around me like the father in the prodigal son story and just welcomes me back. So it's not that we're assured because of our goodness. We're assured because God is faithful and he will always take us back and pursue us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's his faithfulness that works in our weakness. And, but that does require from us that we surrender to him every day. God will never cast us out when we come to him. And Satan has no power at all to take us away from God. Satan is powerless to take you away from God. You can walk away from God. You can let Satan in. But he has no power to overcome us as long as we stay in the Lord. Our security, then, is based on God's faithfulness. Now, Ellen White wrote a letter to a friend, and obviously this, I don't know the whole story, but obviously this friend was so worried about her salvation. And Ellen White wrote her this beautiful letter, and it said, He who so loved you as to give his own life for you, will not turn you off and forsake you unless you willfully, determinedly forsake him to serve the world and Satan. So if we are pursuing God, and the Bible tells us, if you seek me, you will find me if you search with all your heart. And if we search God with all our heart, then we can have assurance of salvation. So, wrapping things up, let's ad address the danger of false assurance. Many think that they're saved, they're going to be lost, and Ellen White tells us why. She says in um, Steps to Christ, because they don't come to the point of yielding their will to God. She says, we are never to rest in a satisfied condition and cease to make advancements saying, hey, I'm saved. I'm good. I don't need to advance. I witnessed to my sister-in-law about the Sabbath. And she said, no, no, I'm good. I don't need the Sabbath. That's presumption. When, he, when we hear truths, we have to go to Scripture and see if they are really true. We have to be open to God's leading and not think we've arrived, we're good, I'm saved, I don't need any more truth, I don't need to improve in any way, because God does want us continually growing in Him. And we need to be open to that continual growing in Him. In other words, we must continue our spiritual growth all our lives, we never stop growing in the Lord. If we are not gaining a victory over sin, sin will be gaining a victory over us. And it's very easy to fall back into our old sinful habits and thoughts. I could go back today, and they would be there for me like old friends, those habits. I'm sure you could too. Instead, we must be watchful. You know, Jesus said about the end times, watch. 
Don't be deceived. We must be watchful in prayer, dedicated to Bible study, seeking the support of our church family, witnessing to others about the great love of God, giving our testimony. And we must pray for guidance on how God wants to use us. You know, God has a plan not just to make your life beautiful, but for you to be a beautiful influence on others. He's got this great plan for you to go out into the world. Shannon and I have been talking about the plan of God in our lives. and he, I just can't wait to see what some of these young adults that we have here, some of our interns and missionaries, are going to do in the world because God has great plans for you. And we have to respond to those plans. Our attitude should be like Isaiah in the, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah when God said, who is going to go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord. Send me. In Spanish, just to impress you, eme aquí, enviame a mí. A little pride uh, Sin of pride coming there. We can never be confident in ourselves. Our hearts are wicked, according to Jeremiah, and our view of ourselves must be distrustful. Remember what uh, Proverbs says, a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to destruction. So distrust ourselves. Only by daily indwelling of the Holy Spirit can we stay faithful. Even the Apostle Peter. Oh, Lord, even if everybody abandons you, I'll be there. I'll go to die with you if I need to. And he denies his Lord. He didn't know himself. And there's areas in which we don't know ourselves. So it's a balance. On the one hand, we need to be distrustful of ourself and cautious of our own perceptions, and not be presumptuous. Beware of our self-confidence and self-reliance. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 10, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. But on the other hand, we should be confident and secure in the faithfulness of a God who gives us the Holy Spirit, who created us in love, and is there to guide us continually. True biblical assurance is based in Christ and the work he's done for us, and not in ourselves. We are aware of the snares of Satan, and it is the power of the Holy Spirit that fights our battles against him. So this is true assurance. And we need to have true assurance. We don't want to spend our lives worrying, fearing the judgment. We want to know that our God is with us and that eternity begins now. Not when we die, but eternity begins right now for us. Eternal life. We don't need to be doubtful about whether we're saved, but we we must exercise the caution, self-distrust, daily total surrender to the Holy Spirit that we've talked about. Our goal must be to grow into the fullness of Christ and to live a righteous life in him. But I want to warn you, if you fall, that doesn't mean you're lost. Proverbs says the righteous man falls seven times. Why? Because he keeps getting up. Right? If we fall, remember these verses. 1 John 2, 1. We have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He forgives. Remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's not going to cast you off just because you fall. The scripture reading from this morning. All that the Father gives me, Christ says, will will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. John 6, 37. 
The Bible encourages us in so many places that we can have true assurance of salvation, not presumption, but true assurance, such as in Romans 8, where Paul says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. Can you imagine? We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. And that's a whole other sermon, but <laughs> I want to follow Christ in his suffering. That we may also be glorified together. And I want to conclude with this comforting thought at the end of the article of Dr. Jerry Moon. Those who come to God daily, trusting in his love, feeding on his word, and submitting themselves to his loving discipline are right with God today and ready if Christ should come today. And every day we live by faith makes it easier and more likely that we'll make the right choice again tomorrow. So will you pray with me to close? Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that we can have true assurance of salvation in you because of your atoning blood. We don't depend on ourselves, Lord, for our salvation, but on your redeeming love and the powerful work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts every day. And we remember, Lord, what Martin Luther said, and it's a good quote to end on. When we look at ourselves, Lord, we don't see how we can be saved. But when we look at Christ, we don't see how we can be lost. And so we are so thankful for your assurance that our eternal life begins today. In Jesus' name, amen.